Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of Jasmine Richardson and Jeremy Steinke? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing anybody in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoyed this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, consider supporting me on Patreon, and check out my podcast on YouTube, Ella Grande Media. I will put the relevant links for those items in the description for this video. So first I'll look at the background in this case, I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. This case takes place in Medicine Hat, Alberta, Canada in 2006. Twelve-year-old Jasmine Richardson lives with her 42-year-old father, Mark, her 48-year-old mother, Deborah, and her eight-year-old brother, Jacob. Mark Richardson works as an instrumentation technician. Mark and Deborah had both struggled with substance use issues in the past, they met each other at a substance use recovery program. They have been married for 15 years. Jasmine was active online. She developed an interest in the Wiccan religion and goth culture. She was a big fan of Jeffrey Dahmer. He was a notorious serial killer who murdered 17 males ages 14 to 31 from 1978 to 1991. After being incarcerated, Dahmer was murdered by another prisoner. It was reported that Jasmine could pass for a 15- or 16-year-old girl, even though, again, she was only 12 years old. Jasmine attracted the attention of a 23-year-old unemployed high school dropout named Jeremy Steinke. It's not clear how the two met. They may have met at a punk rock concert when Jasmine was 11, or they may have met online. Both were heavily invested in dark fantasy. Jeremy claimed to be a 300-year-old reincarnated werewolf who liked the taste of blood. On one of his profiles, he listed his interests as pain and razor blades. Jasmine and Jeremy considered themselves to be in a romantic relationship, which had a sexual component. Mark and Deborah Richardson were not happy about the so-called relationship. Among the many problems, they were greatly troubled by the 11-year age difference and the fact that Jasmine was only 12 years old. Jasmine's parents took her computer away from her to prevent her from communicating with Jeremy, they grounded her, but she would sneak out of the house to see him, and their relationship continued. Jasmine's friends also disapproved of the relationship, which of course could be more accurately conceptualized as a victim-perpetrator situation, not a relationship. Jasmine and Jeremy were communicating online frequently, chatting back and forth. At one point, Jasmine introduced the idea of killing her family. She wrote, quote, I have this plan. It begins with me killing them and ends with me living with you, unquote. Jeremy responded, quote, I love your plan, but we need to get a little more creative with like details and stuff, unquote. Late on April 22 and early on April 23, 2006, Jeremy and his friends watched the 1994 movie Natural Born Killers. Jeremy drank an entire case of beer, as well as a large quantity of wine and vodka. He also did several lines of cocaine and took at least one ecstasy pill. He put on a ski mask, black fishnet arm stockings, a leather wristband, a neck bandana, and eyeliner. He retrieved two knives. He drove to the Richardson family home and made entry. Deborah Richardson walked down to the basement to investigate after hearing noise. Right as she turned on the basement light, Jeremy started stabbing her. He would stab her 12 times in total. Deborah would not survive. Mark heard Deborah screaming, grabbed a screwdriver, and went to investigate. Jeremy attacked him as well. The two men fought, and Mark almost gained the upper hand, but ultimately would succumb to 24 stab wounds. Jeremy would later say that Mark asked why, just before he died. Jeremy responded, It's what your daughter wanted. Jeremy went upstairs to find Jasmine with her brother Jacob. She was trying to calm him down. Jacob would later be found in his bed with stab wounds and his throat cut. Jasmine and Jeremy blamed each other for this homicide, with each saying the other one murdered Jacob. It is believed that both directly participated in this murder after unsuccessfully trying to suffocate Jacob. The pair would leave the Richardson family home and go to an apartment of a friend where they would have sex. After this, they went on the run. The bodies of the three murder victims were discovered on April 23 at 1 p.m. A six-year-old boy, who was a neighbor of the Richardsons, 
walked over to play with Jacob. When no one answered the door, he looked through the basement windows of the house and saw the bodies. He went back to his house and told his mother, who walked over and saw the same thing. She yelled for someone to call the police. When the police arrived, they found Deborah's body in the basement. She was only wearing a nightgown. Not far from her was Mark's body. He was wearing black boxer shorts. There was a screwdriver and a knife on the floor next to his body. The police would find Jacob's body upstairs. It appeared as though he tried to use a toy Star Wars lightsaber to defend himself. The police noticed a family photograph that featured Jasmine. They were worried that she may have been a victim too. Perhaps she had been kidnapped by the assailant. The police found a hand-drawn 12-panel cartoon in Jasmine's locker at school. It featured a girl who burned her family to death by putting gasoline in a sprinkler system. At one point, one of the victims who was burning on the ground talks about how they are in unimaginable pain. The police found evidence of the correspondence between Jasmine and Jeremy on a computer. Friends of Jasmine said that she often spoke of wanting to kill her mother and father. The police believe that Jasmine was a victim before they found the drawing, the information on the computer, and spoke to her friends. Now Jasmine was a suspect. The police would arrest Jasmine and Jeremy the next day at a high school in the town of Leader, which was about 100 miles away. They were each charged with three counts of first-degree murder. On the day they were arrested, they had been laughing and joking with their friends about the homicides. A 19-year-old friend of Jeremy's named Casey Lancaster had allegedly drove them in her pickup truck and disposed of evidence. She was arrested and charged with being an accessory. In separate trials, Jasmine and Jeremy were found guilty on all counts. Under Canadian law, anyone who was under 14 years of age when they committed the crime could not be sentenced as an adult and could not receive more than 10 years in prison. On November 8, 2007, Jasmine was sentenced to the maximum of 10 years, although she was given 18 months credit for time served. In addition, after her prison sentence, she needed to spend four years in a mental health facility and four and a half years on probation. On December 15, 2008, Jeremy was sentenced to three life sentences to be served concurrently with a minimum of 25 years in prison. He's eligible for parole in 2033. That time should fly by for him considering he is a 300-year-old werewolf. As part of a plea bargain, Casey Lancaster pleaded guilty to obstruction. She was sentenced to one year of house arrest and had to stop using drugs and alcohol. Jasmine Richardson was released from a mental hospital in the fall of 2011. She had expressed remorse for her behavior. On May 6, 2016, her sentence was complete. She is totally free, under no restrictions whatsoever. Now moving to my analysis. I'll start with Jeremy Steinke, and then I'll move to Jasmine Richardson. Jeremy had an extensive history of trauma. His mother was unable or unwilling to regulate her consumption of alcohol. His father left Jeremy when he was two years old, after which his mother had a series of intoxicated and violent boyfriends. These boyfriends would often mistreat Jeremy. Jeremy was bullied frequently and severely by his peers. He started developing anger problems early on. One of his classmates remembers an outburst in the fifth grade where he screamed at a teacher. He was described as extremely immature. He would often hang out with girls younger than himself. They liked him because he was old enough to buy alcohol. One mental health clinician believed that Jeremy had fetal alcohol syndrome. Jeremy was extremely interested in fantasy and violence, highly impulsive, irresponsible, and used drugs and alcohol excessively. The police tricked Jeremy into having a conversation with an undercover officer. The officer was dressed up as a prisoner. He was with Jeremy when Jeremy was being moved from one facility to another. Jeremy confessed to the undercover officer. He said that he thought what he and Jasmine did expressed true love. Jeremy would say that he did not understand the seriousness of what he was doing. After his arrest, Jeremy sent Jasmine a question. He said, quote, you said you want to get engaged, then here's a question, will you marry me? If so, then it is a verbal agreement, unquote. It shouldn't be surprising that Jeremy thought that a positive response to his written question formed a verbal agreement. 
Jasmine responded, quote, I never thought I'd find myself hysterically laughing in a holding cell in these kinds of circumstances, or ever really, but still, you make me happy. Yes, yes, I will. I would love to, unquote. I'm surprised these two were allowed to communicate with each other while in prison. Shockingly, the pair would break up while incarcerated. Now moving to Jasmine Richardson. Jasmine underwent mental health treatment when she was in custody. She had anxiety, depression, dependency issues, excessive fantasies, and was immature. She would say that she was not serious when she sent those messages to Jeremy saying she wanted to kill her family, or when she made that drawing, which featured her killing her family. Jasmine claimed that she loved Jeremy so much, and she thought the murders would bring them closer. Friends of Jasmine said that prior to age 11, she was kind, gentle, decent, outgoing, understanding, and an absolutely amazing person. At 11 years old, she started wearing eyeliner, dressing in all black. She wore a dog collar, chains, and short skirts. She developed a fascination with the movie Natural Born Killers and Edward Scissorhands. I've never really thought of Edward Scissorhands as a movie primarily about violence, but it certainly does capture the goth culture. That is probably the part that connected with her. What does the research tell us about this type of crime? This was a case where the parents and their son were killed, but if we just look at the homicides of the parents, this is called double parasite. There are several reasons this particular double parasite would have been extremely unlikely, including double parasite is almost always perpetrated by a son as opposed to a daughter. 96% of double parasitical offenders are sons. Jasmine was not psychotic. Most parasitical offenders are psychotic. Jasmine was only 12 years old when she committed the crime. If we look at other well-known double parasites or attempted double parasites committed by daughters, we see people like Sarah Marie Johnson, who was 16, and Jennifer Pan, who was 24 years old. A 12-year-old female double parasitical offender is almost unthinkable. So looking at the circumstances of the crime and what we see in the research, what do I think happened here? I think what might have happened in this case is that Jasmine became rebellious and her parents didn't quite know how to handle it. They tried to restrict her activities, cut off access to electronic devices, grounded her, things like that, but they didn't adequately supervise her. She managed to do whatever she wanted and to see whoever she wanted to see. In addition, Jasmine was unfortunate enough to have attracted the attention of a criminal. She was a victim as well. I don't think Jasmine would have killed anyone without Jeremy. I think this was a situation where both individuals were invested in fantasies and violence. They managed to find each other based on those similarities. In a sense, they encouraged each other to invest even more in those fantasies. In Jeremy, Jasmine found a new and exciting life. She believed that she was in love. Being with Jeremy was her only priority. Jeremy would have done just about anything Jasmine wanted. He was also caught up in the whole idea that they were in love. Jeremy brought Jasmine's fantasies to life, specifically her fantasy of killing her parents. She was too impulsive and caught up in the fantasy to limit his behavior in any way. Jasmine was isolated. She no longer sought or respected advice from her family or friends. This would be because of Jeremy's behavior. So this relationship, as he would have called it, was one where he was restricting how much contact she had because of her excessive interest in him. Essentially, Jasmine had the idea to kill her family, but Jeremy was the weapon. He only reinforced her nefarious plan. This case is an example of a girl who was given a tremendous amount of power in the form of a criminal who would do whatever she wanted. She thought she had found someone to make her dreams come true, a genie in a bottle, an exceedingly creepy and immature genie, but from her perspective, a genie nonetheless. Her dreams were immature and dangerous, but they may have been partially shaped because she was the victim of this offender. This brings me to this question. Was justice served in this case. Many people believe that Jasmine should have spent 30 or 40 years in prison. They can't believe that she's already completely free in society. She's running around doing whatever she wants to do. I think her prison sentence was too short in duration, but this is a tricky case. 
Jasmine was Jeremy's victim. He was not her boyfriend. He was a criminal harming her. Everyone who was supposed to protect her failed to do so. It's not hard to imagine this type of treatment could help shape and amplify dark fantasies. Jasmine had an interest in goth culture and things like that before meeting Jeremy, but it was only after she met him that she started thinking about homicide. I think a sentence of 20 years would have been reasonable given the circumstances. 30 or 40 years seems like it's too long. Even though there were mitigating circumstances, her behavior was unacceptable in a civil society. The sentence needed to be long enough to ensure she would not be a danger to society. What lesson can we learn in this case? Many young people desire power before they are ready to handle it. They want someone to make their dreams come true, but they have not yet figured out how to distinguish a dream from a nightmare. Those are my thoughts in the case of Jasmine Richardson and Jeremy Steinke. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be informative. Thanks for watching.